Welcome back to Ready Player None, the only podcast that is immune to nostalgia. Previously, there was a huge explosion and everyone died! Not Wade, though. Our special snowflake had previously gained a coin, which he inserted to continue, and gained an extra life. With the Sixers from another sector hot on his trail, Wade enters the third gate, supported by his friends who can see and hear everything he does. But will they be as helpful as a Twitch chat, or bark useless orders like contestants on the British Kids Game Show Nightmare? And will Wade's lesson in humility actually take? Let's find out together in chapter 37. Having stepped through the gate, Wade finds himself in a dark, empty space. There's no walls or ceiling, but there's a floor to stand on. For a moment, there's no clear objective of what to do. Then, a booming electronic voice echoed through the void. It sounded as if it were being generated by a primitive speech synthesizer, like those used in Qbert and Gorf. Beat the high score or be destroyed. A shaft of light illuminates an arcade cabinet. Tempest. This is the final puzzle, and the stakes have never been higher. So for a change, it's actually an arcade game that Wade's not familiar with. In fact, it's Artemis who knows the most about it. You had to know Tempest was going to factor into the third gate somehow. It was so obvious. It turns out that the quote on the final page of Anorak's Almanac is, I must uneasy make, lest too light winning make the prize light. I know the quote, I said, annoyed. It's from Shakespeare, but I figured it was just Halliday's way of letting us know how difficult he was going to make the hunt. Artemis tells him it was also a clue. The quote's from Shakespeare's Tempest. Shit! I hissed. How the hell did I miss that? H missed it too, and she congratulates Artemis. How did you miss that? If you've dissected everything in Anorak's Almanac and all of Halliday's personal files, why would you not look up where that quote's from? That said, this book does quote a non-existent Groucho Marx quip, so maybe a bibliography was never on his client's strong point. The Tempest Arcade Cabinet also appears in a Rush music video, so we're looping back round to Rush again. Shoto says Artemis is good as well, but Wade's just on the defensive that he didn't see it. He doesn't know the game well enough to beat Halliday's high score, which is 728,329 points. There's no margin for error either. The credit counter on the screen says he's only got one life. To be fair, Wade does try inserting the quarter that allowed him to survive the explosion, but the cabinet only accepts tokens. Artemis brings the knowledge yet again. The copyright date of this cabinet suggests it's the earliest version of Tempest. The version that shipped with a bug in the game code. When Tempest first hit the arcades, kids discovered that if you died with a certain score, the machine would give you a bunch of free credits. Wade is ashamed that he didn't know that, but H is complimentary. Thanks, she said. It helps to be an obsessive compulsive geek with no life. Everyone laughed at that except me. I was much too nervous. That seems to be the mission statement of this book. Wrangling a situation in which cataloguing trivial minutia will literally save the world. She goes through a grail diary, an actual physical book in front of her, and she reads out the method inside. First, you need to rack up over 180,000 points. Once you've done that, make sure you end the game with a score where the last two digits are 06, 11 or 12. If you do that, you'll get 40 free credits. You're absolutely positive? Positively absolutely. Ugh, <laughs> cringe. Wade does his standard pre-game stretches, prompting H to say, Christ, will you get on with it? Same. No tolerance for that. He starts up the game. Tempest used old school vector graphics, so the game's images were created from glowing neon lines drawn against a pitch black screen. You're gonna top down the other Yeah, so that's a nine-line paragraph here, just describing the game of Tempest. Speaking of getting on with it, we're in the climax of your book, show some hustle. It takes Wade 15 minutes to get up to the requisite score that will cause the extra credit glitch. He deliberately impales his shooter on a spike. No accidental racial slur involved this time. And after entering his initials, his credit counter jumps up and his friends cheer directly into his ear. He calls Artemis a genius and she says, I know. You are all annoying people. He starts the game up again, now with 40 chances of getting it right. Having found out his real name of Wade Watts at the end of last chapter, Artemis asks him what the O stands for. Obtuse, I said. I'd believe it. She laughed. No, seriously. Owen. Owen, she repeated. Wade Owen Watts. That's nice. I can't read Artemis's dialogue without adding heavy sarcastic emphasis to everything. But I also feel compelled to read it out since this is presumably how the romance is rekindling. His second game is still about 500,000 points short of the mark. They all commiserate him. Artemis tells Wade a story from a diary about how the creator of this game had a nightmare of monsters coming out of a hole to attack him, and that's what inspired the game. She laughed her little musical laugh, which I hadn't heard in so long. Isn't that cool, Z? 
she said. That is cool, I replied. Somehow just hearing her voice set me at ease. I think she knew this, and that was why she kept talking to me. I felt re-energized. Ah, oh, you wet flannel. He starts his third game. Nearly an hour later, I lost my last man. What is it with Americans and saying they're one up some mans? H takes the opportunity to tell him the bad news. They were right about a squad of sixers secluded in a separate sector. Eighteen of them have already entered the gate about five minutes ago. They're all playing simultaneously in separate standalone simulations. They knew how to get into the gate because they were monitoring the castle. And they knew how to get the extra 40 credits because ever since Wade entered the gate, a live video feed of him has been broadcast above the scoreboard. Everyone in the Oasis is watching him. Apparently, Halliday wanted clearing the final gate to be a spectator sport. H tells him they didn't tell him sooner because we didn't want to make you nervous or distract you. And Wade is somewhat hysterical about it. Artemis tells him to cool down, which somewhat works. I'd like for her to be playing him off for her own benefit, but I know that's not the case. Wade gets into the zone like he did with Pac-Man, almost disassociating from reality and everything at stake. It's just him and the game. So there's a short paragraph about the game mechanics there. Then, I'd been playing just over an hour and had cleared level 81 when I heard another wild burst of cheering in my ears. You did it, man! I heard Shoto shout. His score's now over 800,000 points. He instinctively keeps playing, but Artemis clears her throat and he realises he's just wasting time. He depletes his extra lives, intentionally getting a game over. And when he enters his initials again, his high score appears above Halliday's. Then the monitor went blank and a message appeared in the centre of the screen. Well done, Parzival. Prepare for stage two. And then his avatar vanishes. Page break! Oh, Lord. You remember way back when, when Wade was transported into the world of war games, in what in-universe would later come to be known as a flick sink. <laughs> but in this instance, Wade materialises in a sort of medieval landscape, bobbing up and down to the sound of hoofbeats. But he looks down, and he's not riding a horse. And that is the point where I knew exactly where this is going. Behind him is Terry Gilliam holding two halves of a coconut. I knew where I was, inside the first scene of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, another of Halliday's favourite films, and perhaps the most beloved geek film of all time. Ah, oh, you know those people who treat the ability to repeat Monty Python sketches verbatim instead of having a personality? The ending of this book is based around doing that. There's one thing we know, it is science. And math. And the worst every Monty Python routine. We are the knights who say... <laughs> oh my goodness, I can't with this. <laughs> so at this point, he's Graham Chapman's character, King Arthur, and the idea is that he has to recite the dialogue in every scene. Shoto's excited that it's the Holy Grail, but when Wade says, duh, I know that, a warning flashed on my display. Incorrect dialogue. A score of minus 100 points appeared in the corner of my display. Smooth move, X-Lax, I heard Artemis say. What is X-Lax? I hear people say... Oh, it's constipation medicine, okay. H tells him he should do hand gestures if he ever forgets a line of dialogue, because he's got three other gunters in the room, at least one of them's gonna know it. I nodded and gave a thumbs up, but I didn't think I was going to need much help. Over the past six years, I'd watched Holy Grail exactly 157 times. I knew every word by heart. You complete waste, man. I'd say, please do something original with your life, but someone said that to Ernest Klein, and this book is the result. Apparently words do have meaning, at least when they're not being repetitively recited and recycled. So about a page worth of this book is now a Holy Grail novelization. Wade gallops up to a castle, he halloos a soldier over the castle wall, and then we've just got a transcription of the dialogue interspersed with either Wade's friends cheering or his points counter jumping up. For those of you that enjoy Monty Python in its original form, I assume it's everything from the start of the film right up into the line, Where'd Where you, you get, get the, the coconuts? coconuts? And then we've got an extended paragraph telling us how this works. Uh, Wade always plays the character in each scene that has the most dialogue. He flubs only several lines. Uh, he shrugs whenever he needs assistance from the rest of the council. And he says the only difficult part was trying not to laugh himself, especially when Artemis starts doing her own recitations in the background as well. I cracked up a few times and got hit with score penalties for it. Otherwise, it was smooth sailing. My word. Of all the times I've said that this entire book was contrived around one person's specialist knowledge, I never expected the ending to be quite like this. Reciting the film wasn't just easy, it was a total blast. For you, maybe. We and Wade are both kept updated on the Sixers as well. 
Wade's able to communicate with his friends using a text chat based system. Three out of 18 of them are also inside the Holy Grail simulation. And the leader, Sorrento we think, is running just nine minutes behind you. And so far he hasn't missed a single line of dialogue, Shoto added. So there's your supposed tension for this scene. And then we're told that he's kept updated as he keeps playing, and then suddenly he's at the final scene. I grew anxious, wondering what would happen next. The first gate had required me to reenact a movie, War Games, and the second gate had contained a video game challenge, Black Tiger. Like a complete idiot, I just flipped back to see what the third gate was. This is the third gate. Pay attention, Gherkin. So if step one's a movie and step two's a video game, what's three gonna be? Recursion? Recursion? The credits of the movie plays out, and a new message appears on his display. Congratulations, you have reached the end. Ready Player One. We finally dropped the title about 10 chapters after it was going to be relevant. And then, as the text faded away, I found myself standing in a huge oak panelled room as big as a warehouse, with a high vaulted ceiling and a polished hardwood floor. There's no windows, there's a door that won't budge, and in the centre of the room is an older high-end immersion rig. There's also glass tables all around it, arranged like an old video game hardware museum. I'm going to read this one out because I feel like it might be our last slam poem laundry list of the book. A PDP-1, an Altair 8800, an IMSI 8080, an Apple One, right next to an Apple Two, an Atari 2600, a Commodore PET, an Intellivision, several different TRS-80 models, an Atari 400 and 800, a ColecoVision, a TI-994, a Sinclair ZX-80, a Commodore 64, various Nintendo and Sega game systems, the entire lineage of Macs and PCs, Playstations and Xboxes. Finally, completing the circle was an Oasis console, connected to the immersion rig in the centre of the room. Again, both of Ernest Klein's self-inserts have to be at the centre of attention at all times. And it's only now that Wade realises that this is a perfect recreation of Halliday's office. There's never been any public photos of it, but he's heard it described in great detail by the movers hired to clear the place out after Halliday's death. He notices that he's no longer embodying a movie character, his avatar's parsable again, and he realises that the series of glass video game tables around Halliday's rig is in the shape of an egg. We want nothing more than to return to the womb. He calls to mind Halliday's first riddle, right the way back from the very start of the book. Three hidden keys open the secret gates, wherein the errant will be tested for worthy traits, and those with the skill to survive these straits will reach the end where the prize awaits. I literally can't remember if I actually read that out in the first episode. Oh yeah, I didn't. I guess I didn't assume it was relevant at the time. I promise I didn't deliberately obfuscate some of the clues to this mystery. I'm not Ernest Klein. I'd reached the end. This was it. Halliday's Easter egg must be hidden somewhere in this room. End chapter 37. Oh my word, you guys. I cannot tolerate much more of this man's nonsense. I've said before about how the pop cultural trappings of this book make it fall down when it comes to serious moments, but this is the first chapter where that seems to be deliberately invoked. We're right here at the end of things, after a brief moment where we think that Wade's extensive knowledge won't get him through a game of Tempest, we're then promptly shoved into a breather episode of reciting Monty Python. The updates on the Sixers attempt to contribute to the tension, but I feel like it's too little too late. Setting out on this book, this entire kind of power fantasy, we always knew he was going to win. I haven't read the ending yet and I'm treating that as a given. But the interesting thing in stories like these is supposed to be how it happens. What the hero has to do to make it play out. And it turns out what he has to do is just be a huge geek. I'm a huge geek. When do I get a win? And again, I'm in the wrong generation to care about any of this. I was reading an article the other day, this was promoted as young adult fiction. That's what I'd initially assumed it was before coming around and deciding it was a book for man children. So when the movie version came out a few years ago, if this was promoted to late teens, say, do modern day late teens care about Tempest or Monty Python or anything going on? This book is just a regurgitation of pop cultural ideas. It's modern day capitalist culture in microcosm. Its hero sets out to use his esoteric knowledge to get rich off other people's ideas. And it's sold so well because a bunch of 30 and 40 somethings just want to be children again. Does this make any sense? It's a huge heat wave. I have no idea what I'm saying anymore. The bottom line is Ernest Klein doesn't deserve to be a millionaire for this regurgitation of ideas. <sighs> For more of my content, you can follow me on Twitter at The Last Gherkin or follow the show on Twitter at RPN underscore pod. Watch along with subtitles on YouTube, The Last Gherkin, or get an MP3 download by making a wish on a falling star. Join us next time for our penultimate episode. Penultimate episode? We're nearly there. I've made a weekly podcast since January.
Wow. That's something to remember me by. Welcome back to Ready Player None. I'm going to have to start Audacity again because the timeline's not moving along while I'm speaking. It's Friday night. It's Ready Player None. Do you know where your video games are? She goes through a Dale... Dale Gryery. Everyone in the Gunter. Everyone in the Gunter. Everyone in the Oasis is watching him. I didn't think of anything funny. 